Tim will be here in a, in a matter of minutes. Uh, so I will open up our uh, May 22nd, 2023 City Council workshop. Uh, we have two items on our uh, agenda for tonight. As to, we have the Board and Commission Survey to Student Arts and Cultural Resources and Library Strategic Plan. Um, and we only have, we're missing quite a, uh, we're working a few counselors tonight, but hopefully we can still give some good direction. Um, so we'll just start off the conversation with our first item on the board and commission survey discussion, and I'll turn it over to our, our uh, interim city administrator. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, counselors. So we're here tonight to talk about um, a potential uh, survey or the survey or potential ballot item in November. So we're going to have a brief. Uh, presentation and then more robust discussion ensuring that we're in alignment on the proposed survey with council expectations, um, talk about the polling. Uh, some of you may remember David from Magellan Strategies who conducted our poll in 2019 for our mental health and human services tax as well as our public safety. Um, and then talk about potential ballot language and some discussion. So um, this slide should be familiar. Uh, we go through this process every year, kind of evaluating early on the year any potential ballot items. This occurred in February, at which point staff or council gave staff feedback to start to explore changes to the requirements to serve on a board or commission. We then engage with Magilla Live Strategies to come up with a draft proposal for your review. So right now we are in that March to July mm -hmm. gathering additional information and may include polling phase. Uh, with the intent to return back to council and decide whether you want to place this item on the ballot for sure, given the results, and then uh, certify in September for a November election. So as a reminder to serve on a border commission, there are three requirements. One must be a Lafayette resident for one year at the time of appointment, in good standing with Lafayette in the state of Colorado. Good standing is really referred to financial standing, so not to be you know, in default of your water bill or your taxes, so we really look at that and then a registered voter. And so that third bullet is what council indicated interest in after hearing from some community members and the Human Rights Commission about removing the requirement uh, to be a voter registered um, participant. And so we directed staff to explore polling and we are here tonight um, by way of background. Uh, we have put this map before the voters, three sort of different versions the first one was broad exemptions. Council could exempt any sort of qualification. The second question was both residency and required voter registration. And then the third one, as um, late as 2016, was the only the voter registration requirement. So with that, I will turn it over to David sure. uh, Magellan Strategies. Yeah, thanks, uh, everybody. It's great to be here again. We appreciate the opportunity to do some uh, survey research for you um, on this unique ballot measure and topic it really is this is uh, you know been doing this for 15 years and this is kind of a first actually so um my firm uh we founded about 16 years ago uh in Louisville, right next door we work with school districts and local governments and special districts uh, to do all sorts of ballot measure surveys um you know in 2021 we managed a public safety and mental health project for you all um you know to b and to c which you know our work we don't mean to toot our horn you know what i mean but we did a good job about forecasting support levels there and um that came in very well to secure that funding for those needs um other communities that we work for in the area you know city of boulder lewisville broomfield brighton towns of erie and mead we also do a lot of survey work for boulder valley school districts as well as 12 out of 12 five star schools um you know the presentation outline of basically um what I'm going to talk about today is uh, talk about the demographics of an odd year election in the city of Lafayette so you can understand sort of what the larger subgroups are by party affiliation as well as age that make up the electorate because it does matter. Um, you know, next year is going to be a presidential year. You're going to have much younger turn on and get to that. We're going to talk about our data collection methodology, how we're going to interview and engage the community and then uh, go through what the goals and the objectives are of this project. Okay, on this slide, I know, please don't make your head spin. There's a lot of numbers here, but this is really sort of the foundations of a solid survey to really make sure that we are accurately forecasting so that the survey results are weighted to be representative of an odd year election. And what I really want to point to is if you go back and look at 2021 and 2019, uh, let's just look at the age groups to begin with. You know, seniors, 65 and older, um, 
across sort of your four-year spectrum is when they're at their largest. Um, you know, so I'm just pointing that out where they typically make up about 30% of all votes cast. Younger voters, 18 to 34, even though they are your largest voting uh, group by uh, the five age group segments, um, they only make up about 15% of the vote. It's not that surprising. Younger voters are just much less likely to engage in an odd year election. Um, so what we will do for this survey is we will wait uh, the survey results. So they're close to 21 and 2019. Um, it'll be roughly 51% uh, Democrat affiliated voters, 37% unaffiliated, and 11% Republican. So I just want you to understand and have this information because we'd like people to be involved and, and know what we're looking at. Survey data collection methodology. Um, really, since 2020, um, we have adopted and tested and really embraced sending MMS text survey invitations. This is phenomenal. In the old days, we would have to do phone only, you know, cells and landlines, and honestly, it can cost 40 to $50 for one survey interview for like a 12 minute, 10 minute long survey. But off of the voter file, we can send an MMS text, and what I mean by that is it has the image of the logo on it, and we pay more for that. Um, to be very honest, it's about eight or nine cents. Uh, where a the spammy non-image ones are like two to three, and look, that's not going to you know instill trust in the survey. So you know we always use this approach and have a friendly message: Hello, Lafayette residents. City of Lafayette invites you to participate in an important survey regarding two ballot measures to fund public safety and mental health and human service needs. This is the invitation that we sent on our first survey that we did for you. Um, and, and it does a great job. We are going to be able to engage 50% of your registered voter population. Um, the cell phone numbers, if you're wondering where they're from, um, most communities in Colorado on the voter file, nearly there'll be 35% of an adult population cell phone numbers will be on there. We use another uh, group out of Elkhorn, Nebraska, called CSS Direct, and they append also some cell phone numbers. That way we have the largest sample size problem when we try to achieve 50% coverage of the registered voter population. Um, in addition to doing that, um, we work with uh, Debbie Wilmot, like we did last time, to put out public communication, letting people know, hey, on Thursday, June 7th in the afternoon, we're going to be kicking off our survey related to, about a unique ballot measure that we're going to be talking about. You know, she will send that out via email off the city's, uh, you know, listserv. We don't have to touch that file. She's just going to send the image, the link, and the message and say, there's three ways to participate in the survey. One, some of you are going to get an email just like this. Other ones, you're going to get a text that looks like that. Uh, and then some of you can visit the City of Lafayette's homepage and you can take this survey. And um, trust me when I can tell you, people are like, wait a minute, people are not sort of self-selecting and it's not statistically random and all that. In all honesty, a good survey's foundation gives the population as many opportunities as possible to participate. And those numbers I just showed you about how to weight the survey demographically and appropriately is really, as long as we get that right and we're letting everybody out there, out of our, I don't know, 450 MMS tech surveys that we've been doing since 2020, there's only one instance where we've had somebody where clearly they're trying to mess around with the numbers and so forth. So again, it's a solid method that's been tested and if it didn't hold up, we wouldn't you know, our, our forecasting of how these uh, of support and opposition levels for various ballot measures wouldn't be there. Okay, objectives. Um, this is very unique. Um, very unique ballot uh, question and item and topic. Um, but basically what we want to measure is, and we've changed this a little bit from uh, talking with other community members and staff, so we've had a couple of iterations on the survey and we really appreciate the feedback from folks on staff but also that are engaged in uh, this issue. Um, we're going to be measuring opinions obviously to removing the voter registration requirement. Um, we're going to educate and inform respondents about the reasons why this city is engaging in this. We know that different versions of this ballot measure have not succeeded over time um, and so we want to kind of be somewhat honest. What, what's the real concerns that you may have or what you want? So we've designed questions to sort of draw that out without being, it's pretty direct and we can get to those questions in a little bit, but just, you know, about non-document perhaps or undocumented individuals. Is, are you really concerned? Is there an element, a group of folks in the community that share an attitude and a viewpoint perhaps where they believe this will do something that it may or may not. So we want to use this survey to educate and inform folks 
as much as why we're doing this, uh, and we can get to that in a little bit. Um, and ideally, we just really want to measure accurately uh, if something was, or one of the iterations of these ballot measures is put before voters this November that we can do a good job of forecasting where it'll be. So in February, we had talked very briefly about what the potential what language would look like. So part of the discussion tonight is to sort of make sure, now that you guys have had some time to sit on it, is this the ultimate one. If you notice in the survey, we are testing other scenarios. We just end the survey with this kind of, now if the city were to actually put a specific question, here's what it would be. Um, so part of that is that, um, but we will have information on more broadly speaking, are you just okay getting rid of the voter registration for all boards and commissions? More broadly speaking, are you okay with getting it except for planning commission? This is probably the most um, detailed portion about the two members and the chair still being voter registered. So um, this is what we have. I'll put it back up. I'll briefly review the timeline. So again, want to finalize, um, answer any questions, finalize the potential survey questions to get out in June, I'll come back to you and present the findings in July, and then We'll have between July and September to make a final council motion to adopt the ballot language if you want to move forward. So really the questions tonight for discussion is whether you agree with the proposed approach and test ballot language. So with that, Mayor, I'll turn it back over to you. Yep, sounds good. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, so I guess uh, before we get into the discussion on if we um, wanting to put this forward on the ballot, are there any questions on the presentation we just received? Thank you, Mayor. Um, <coughs> I was looking through the language on uh, one of the examples, and it was trying to bring it up really quickly. Here. Sure. Was that a draft? Because there was a, there's a, I think it was the second uh, option question. It said, since you voted yes, when the, it was referred to a no response, Sorry, I can't bring this up. Are you, where we get to the open-ended counselor, are you asking that where on T11? Yes, T11. Yeah, so our approach, what we like to do is we have first what's called an uninformed ballot language. And in T11, that language, shall sections, X, Y, or Z, like that's the ballot language that we're really testing. And we do it first in T, where is it? Yeah, see, because we do it we do it twice. One, we do it before we tell anybody about the reasons why this is being considered, and then we do it afterwards, because that's likely what voters will learn about either through the Blue Book or from an adequate campaign. And so the reason we're using the open-ended is afterwards saying, please describe the reasons why you would vote yes and approve ballot measure on T12. That's only being asked to people that if they responded, I'm definitely voting yes and approving or probably voting yes and approving. It's the no one where it says. Oh, that's a error. I completely okay. apologize. It should say, please describe the reason why you vote no and reject the ballot language. My apologies. Okay, I, I just wasn't sure. Yeah, no, 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 good, it's not good. No, my, sometimes we move a little bit quickly. Yes, so that open-ended language and capturing that verbatim response is going to be very helpful in I think making a decision for you all about where their holdup may be shed some light on that so yes I apologize for that that was an error okay I just needed to make sure yeah, that no, was an error because I didn't I was yes like, it is absolutely it right no, but, uh, my, my fault um, the other piece is if I may there of course yeah. um, and I know this would be difficult to include City Council in this um, to say that, with the exception of planning commission, um, it's also with the exception to city council, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Mm -hmm. And I don't know because when I was, yeah, I was in, I was guided to do the commissions and boards to get an understanding of what it would be like to be on city council, and this kind of disconnects that relationship from mm -hmm. from this being a stepping stone into being on city council and I more words is just going to be confusing but I that was just one of my concerns is that I, I'm wondering if you think that the public might think that this is some kind of uh, they might get confused as to how this would affect city being on city council and I don't know that it would but I'm just concerned that there's no connection with how this is associated with 
being on city council. Yeah. Perhaps be instead of putting it in more of the ballot language, when we do up front and we say, as you may know, boards and commissions include, mm -hmm. like, I think we do, library board, and yep. rights, and yep. a few others. You yes. Could, we could have a simple statement that says this excludes city council, you mm -hmm. know, at this point, or something like that education piece versus the ballot language getting. Yeah, because when I've asked people about it, they they oh. seem concerned, and I'm like, why? And they don't okay. know if that's one of the things that they're wondering if this is. You, let's clarify. Let's put that in there. That's that's not an issue at all, and I don't think it'll bias responses. Or just to make people clear and understand, we are not talking about city council. Yeah, I, mean, yes. I agree. And this doesn't include include Laura either. That's correct. Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, then we can get to the, the discussion piece here. Um, so, the city council agree with the proposed approach um, and. To at least test the bout language. Are you all right with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I got an email from Councillor Walton saying uh, she wanted me to express some of just her thoughts. That I support the ballot measure. I'm in support of the expense to poll with the outcome to determine what ballot polling language gets us to a winning ballot measure in support of broadening boards and commissions. So I think, yeah, I think you have overall consensus that council is willing to invest one more time to see how we can get to the, that winning language to see if we can open up. Okay. And then I guess finally, is this the question you guys, this is modeled after 2015, um, except for the residency requirement. So we will, like I said, we will be testing kind of three different scenarios. It's just yes. before the education occurs. Mm -hmm. And so this would be really the kind of... And we're really we're, trying to bring the respondents along in a logical manner to know that there are slightly different versions you know what i mean but then also being relatively clear because you know that there's one where the chair and all but two board members yeah. versus just straight up we remove voter registration requirement and we will have measurements on that it's we don't need actual ballot language you know across all those <coughs> scenarios the paraphrase should be fine. And even though this may seem simple, you know, like we've worked really hard to try to minimize any ambiguity and confusion around this and while still being direct so that we're sure respondents understand what we're referring to. And honestly, this is a little bit more challenging than we thought, but I, I think I think we've come up to, with a good draft right now that should capture that to hang our hat on and be like, all right, here's where we are, you know. And if there is still unfortunate significant ambiguity and confusion around we'll pick it up in that the notes you know what i mean they're like i still am really not sure what's going on here and we'll obviously report that data back to you uh, to try to help you arrive at a decision perhaps you may not go with that language perhaps something that is even more spelled out and simple and clear um it, that may be necessary but it it will serve the community better and Lori was like, all right, now I know where you guys are coming from. You know, absent a, you know, semi-educated voter, you know, when they vote on their ballots this November. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder about the word electors. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. All board and commission members be electors of the city. I wonder if that's clear enough to the common voter. I, I have concerns about that. I, I'm not sure everybody will, but I didn't know if we had to go with electors. We just took, based upon February direction, yep. the language and just took out the residency, but that could certainly be, must be, voter registered voters of the city. Yeah, something more specific, because I don't think people will understand what this, what that means. Right, and I would, you know, if we're okay to work with city council on drafting this, you know what I mean, because, you know, to paraphrase this, I would stick in there, also known as just registered voters. Mm -hmm. Um, to clarify that is how we would do it, but then I just yeah. want to make sure that you know, uh, you know, your your ballot attorney, you know, counsel in house or whatever is like, oh, that that, that can't be put in there. You know what I mean? Like we don't try to hop out of our lane, but at the same time, my job is like, look, you want me putting stuff out that people clearly understand. So, make that change. yeah, we'll make the change. You know, what I mean, also know it's just simply registered voters. You know, but. Mm -hmm. yeah, how did we get to the um, part of provided that the chair and all but two members are registered voters? 
So that was the 2015 language. And again, in that February discussion, when council was kind of muddling through what they wanted a potential question to look like, a few said, we like the way 2015 was spelled out, except 2015 also included the exemption for residency. And I know council was like, well, we want people that live here, obviously not from mm -hmm. a different city to serve on it. But right. so we just mirrored that one. Um, like I said, it's been put before in various forms. The 2016 um, just removed it including planning commission everyone any member so it, this is really up to council and again we are testing on those versions as well so you have that data so this by no means binds you to any sort of language it just kind of is the one that we test early and test after to see if people's opinions have changed throughout the survey yeah i just keep getting this question like why why <laughs> no good question i was let me interrupt I, mean, I was thinking the exact same thing about how you landed on that i think you know what you're trying to do maybe find some kind of happy medium it was going to build more support to get it done rather than doing the whole but i was thinking the exact same thing so i was just curious to... yeah i think that'd be good to get some feedback on if, if that's that piece is necessary or not yep. chair and all mm -hmm. yeah okay mm -hmm. um and we have time, you know, because we're not going to be going in the field right after Memorial yeah. Day. We have all of June, and the, the survey will be open a minimum of two weeks, you know, and that's plenty of time for us to have it out there. And that's the other thing. We're going to be sending multiple text reminders, multiple reminder emails. It'll be out there. And, you know, we call, we'd like to let it soak for a bit, you know what I mean? And then we can go over two weeks and then pull the data down and compile it. All right. Sounds good. Um, any other direction the council needs to? No, appreciate the conversation tonight so we can keep it moving forward. Yep. All right. Great. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all so much for joining us. Yes. Good to see you. All right. So our next agenda item, this is the Arts and Cultural Resources and Library Strategic Plan. We are going to get some nameplates off. Yeah, we'll give you a minute to get set up and we'll get started. soon but we can just go ahead and get started um, so uh, I believe our city administrator are you kicking this off yeah I am all right good evening again thank you we are very excited for this next item talking about a draft library and arts and cultural resources strategic plan as many of you remember we um, went out to bid last year to hire a consultant. Uh, part of the reason why we wanted to do these two kind of plans together is really in that community engagement process. These two departments serve um, very similar clientele, have very uh, similar processes and events that um, go over our community, even though the Arts and Cultural Resources Department is newer and libraries a little bit more established, it's really important for us to save um, our residents time by doing some of this community outreach but also see where there's some overlap between the two departments and so i am very excited that we have our consultants here from persona to talk about that community input and then also um, our newly appointed uh, library or arts and cultural resources director rachel hansen i'm very excited to have that official on friday and then our library director melissa heisel so I will turn it over to them and we will be here. I also would be remiss if I didn't thank the members of the library board uh, for being here as well. Both boards have been 
highly involved through this kind of nine month process. So. All right, well, I will hand it over to David and Tyler with Persona. They're going to talk about the community engagement process that we engaged in. This was super, super important to us. Um, and then Rachel and I will talk a little bit about uh, some of the things in the plan that we're especially excited about. So I'll start us off. Uh, my name is David Thoreau. I'm a principal at Persona, and we've been working um, with the ACRD and the library for the last almost year now. Uh, we'll talk a little about the journey that we went on, uh, what, would, what the outcomes of that journey were, and how we're going to structure today's conversation seems to be similarly to how we structured the project, which is where we started off talking about the same kind of community engagement and information gathering up front. We're going to talk about that first, and then we're going to talk a little bit about specifically about what we found for the library, and then Melissa's going to talk about what she's excited about from the library's plan, We'll break and have a few minutes for converse for questions and kind of things specific to the library's plan. And then we'll, we'll recoil a little bit and go back and talk about the ACRD specifically, talk about some of the findings for the ACRD and what the plan actually materialized into. <coughs> we have about an hour slated. I know you guys have a little more time on your schedule as well, so we can just uh, have plenty of time for questions and comments. Um, go to the next slide, please. So here's the journey that we went on. So starting in July of 2022, uh, we had started the conversations, went through the proposal process, and really try to ground um, the, the strategic planning process into some fundamental um, outcomes. We're a very much outcome-focused organization, so we wanted to see what, at the end of this process, what's different for the library, what's different for the ACRD, and then what are the planning principles? What are some of the key questions we want to make sure we're constantly coming back to and talking through specifically, making sure that our plan is getting to the outcome that we desire at the end of the process. We're going to go into all of these components in detail, I um, do want to introduce them now in the beginning part. Um, the second piece was, or the, the, actually the next two pieces were really around getting information and data and bringing that to the fold of saying, we need to understand the current state, or to understand both the ACRD and the uh, library in, in internal uh, operations and talking with the teams, talking with some organizations that are really close to the library and the ACRD, just to really understand some of the challenges um, and opportunities that both organizations face. Uh, we also did a deep dive into the legacy La uh, Lafayette plan, comprehensive plan, and a bunch of other the other kind of guiding documentation. So we wanted to make sure that any plan that we were building was in alignment with that. And as Melissa introduced, um, the community engagement piece that we did was the was the bulk of the time on this project was really getting hearing from the community and bringing the information in so that we could really make an informed plan uh, that was reflective of the um, the community that both these organizations are. And we did that kind of in in, in tandem throughout that process. Um, working closely with both the organizations, asking questions about from, from both vantage points, uh, but using those same kind of conversations to get good information. All that materialized into a diagnosis, which is just a, a fancy term for what did we find out, and collectively, how did that information come together? What were the challenges, what were the opportunities that each organization had? This is where the plans start to bifurcate, and we had a diagnosis via ACRD and a diagnosis for the library. And then that ultimately um, materialized into strategic plans for both organizations. Um, and so we'll be talking through a little bit about that and the different components of the strategic plan in, in just a few slides. Uh, I'll, I'll say one of the other things that we probably thought would be an interesting, um, an interesting fact as well is the amount of time that was put into this proposal, or does this work to these two different plans. Um, uh, from our end, from the consulting side, over 1,200 hours have gone into this work. From the community side, over 250 hours have gone into this work. And from the staff time, it's two to 300 hours worth of work that's gone into this. So over, over 150 hours have gone into building these two separate plans. So it's a huge monumental amount of work that people from the community have engaged in, the teams have engaged in, the leadership teams from organizations, uh, and from outside consulting services. So quite a, quite a undertaking to get to where we are today. Um, the first piece on that roadmap that we just talked about were the um, the four uh, strategic principles that we came up with, and essentially how these manifested were around questions we wanted to constantly come back to and make sure that the plans were addressing. So the first one was community responsiveness. And so the question we really wanted to focus on is, are the needs, priorities, and goals of the community reflected in this plan? We kept coming back to that to make sure that, as we built these plans out, that the, that, that, that was true. The second one around potential for impact. We wanted to make sure that the plan orients each organization towards activities that will have material, sustainable, and positive impact on the community. We wanted to make sure that what we were doing wasn't just you know, more of the same and not actually meeting the needs of the community. So how does it drive impact for, um, for the community? The third is around values alignment. So how are these strategies authentically living out the values of each organization, their staff, and the comprehensive plan? 
And then finally, we wanted to make sure that we were using, we were, that we had a possibilities orientation. So we wanted to make sure that the strategic plan wasn't just um, you know, limiting by resources or staff or whatever the capabilities. We wanted to open up the aperture to say, what is the art of the possible for both these organizations that we could consider? Um, and, and, and took a lot of questions. A lot of the questions that we did was try to understand, like, what are some things we're not doing that maybe we could do and focus on? Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tyler to talk about the next two pieces, which really are learning, our learning phases. And so he's going to walk you through the details of those and then turn it back to me to take you on the strategy. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, David. So we'll spend the next few slides really honing in on the information gathering phase of the strategic planning process. Information gathering has kind of two foundational phases. The first called current state analysis. That's where we begin by looking really closely inside of the organization <clears throat> and the surrounding ecosystem. We then sort of move outward, and that's where we talk about community engagement, which, uh, as Katie touched on at the top, which is a really significant component of this plan. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So starting with current state analysis. Um, within, oh, and by the way, all the information um, regarding current state analysis is an item B of the packets that we received prior to the meeting, and throughout the next few slides, we'll be looking at items B, C, and D in uh, the council's packets. So um, within current state analysis, there are two separate phases. There's internal stakeholder engagement and there's current state validation. Internal stakeholder engagement, what we do is we go inside the organization, we hold lots of interviews and group conversations with departmental staff, managers, and directors. We also use an internal staff survey that was distributed to both departments. And the questions that we ask in these conversations and in the survey are really built around organizational strengths and challenges, as well as the ways in which the departments could be better meeting community needs. And this also some sort of high level questions around what does the ideal future look like for each department? David kind of talked about that with the art of the possible. After that internal stakeholder engagement, we widen the aperture a little bit and go just slightly outside of the organization. And this would include conversations, both individual interviews and roundtable conversations with stakeholders like city managers, um, departmental boards such as the library board, uh, volunteer groups and relevant local organizations or commissions such as Friends of the Library, the Public Arts Committee, Arts Lafayette, um, and a group of library volunteers as well. We supplement these conversations with a document review of relevant city documents. In this case, this would include, among others, the Lafayette Comprehensive Print Plan, the PROS Master Plan, the Housing Plan, the Sustainability Plan, the Strategic Plan, and also some resident surveys from past efforts. We then bookend this process with secondary external research for benchmarking and trend analysis. We put all of this together and it results in the current state analysis, which we do analyze through the SOAR framework. You see a sample of that on the slide here. Thank you. So moving from current state analysis into community engagement, uh, which is the second component of the information gathering phase. This is a very detailed community engagement report is an item B of the board packets. And at the top of the slide, you see here uh, our definition of community engagement, which means that uh, community engagement is the act of involving those who are affected by, by a decision in the decision making process and that meaningful community engagement results in new relationships and wider support. And the reason that we highlight this two-sentence definition is to emphasize that community engagement is not only about connecting really quality data that we can use to inform the strat plan, but it is also, and very importantly, about increasing positive perceptions of the organization, in this case both departments across the community, and creating a network of advocates and supporters from across the community that can amplify the mission and the work of each of the departments. And we felt like that was something that we were satisfied with in our work at community engagement. Um, for both plans, and as, as we've touched on, we knew that community engagement was going to be a very central focal part of the work, and that both departments wanted a representative, inclusive community engagement process to be uh, kind of a foundational piece of what eventually became the, the STRAP plans. You can see uh, the kind of scope of that effort reflected in the bottom two-thirds of this slide, where you can see a top-line summary of the reach of the community engagement process. This was about 15 total round conversations that engaged over 100 folks from across Lafayette. Of those 15 roundtable conversations, six were comprised of community leaders. These were typically um, sort of hand-picked groups of folks who represented different grassroots organizations from around the community. 
and nine are what we're calling stakeholder specific or group specific roundtables. These focus on collecting perspectives of uh, very targeted stakeholder groups and you can see some of those groups at the bottom of this slide that would include um, everyone from arts grants recipients to a group of local business owners. We engaged a group of folks from local mobile home parks. Um, we had a Spanish-speaking uh, round rule. We engaged a group of K-12 educators. Uh, we tried to target the youth voice through the Lafayette Youth Advisory Commission. We had a group of uh, representatives uh, from the intellectual and developmental disability community. Um, so just kind of a sampling of how robust and, and authentic we wanted that uh, level of input to be. So, um, kind of the bookend of the community engagement process and the culminating activity uh, was a citywide survey. You can see the survey report in item D of your board packets. Um, we worked uh, very intensely with departmental leadership and the marketing teams at, at or the marketing team at the library to develop and distribute a survey that we hope really kind of maximized the reach. It went um, as broad as we possibly could beyond that original act of the of the round table, community roundtable conversations. At the bottom of the slide, you can see some sample social media postings that were used to publicize the survey. Um, I know at the library we handed out bookmarks that had QR codes allowing people to access the survey. We developed a postcard uh, with survey information and an additional QR code that uh, went along with the newsletter and was distributed with the water bill. Um, so really tried to get the reach as far as we possibly could. At the top of the slide, you can see some basic information about respondent demographics. There's a lot more detail on that in the survey report. I think um, kind of the overall takeaway is we're pretty satisfied with the representativeness of the survey. I think we actually over-index towards groups that are typically underrepresented in open survey responses. I think we credit this to the, the preceding community <coughs> engagement work, which as we touched on, tried to target really non-traditional groups and very grassroots types of stakeholders. Um, we do call that kind of our grass tops philosophy, where we can get to the roots of the community by activating leaders who, who are really connected with those communities and can serve as liaisons. Um, and with that, I will pass it back after that review of kind of the information gathering phase. David's going to talk some more about what's actually kind of the bones of the strategy. So um, I'm going to jump in, talk a little bit like structurally how the strategy sh sh uh, shook out, talk a little bit about some of the library findings, and then pass it over to Melissa to talk a little bit about the library specific strategic plan. Um, so how do you take all that information, 1,100 data points, and consolidate it and make sense of it. Um, so what we do, please go to the next slide. Um, we take all that information from the current state and the community engagement, and we do a synthesis effort, effort, and we consolidate it into a large success spreadsheet where every 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 single cell has a different uh, person's perspective in it, and we use a human-centered design approach to be able to move that around within the within the database to be able to understand all the different perspectives. And so, that using human-centered design is an important approach, just because. It allows for voices, individual voices or individual comments to elevate to the same louder voices that are the more that are trending. So if there's lots of different people saying the same thing, using a human centered design approach and one person says something that gets the same weight as another, another comment. So you have to look at those two and say, which is most impactful for us? And we're allowed to really hear the voices of, of the community. So all that gets boiled down into what we call a diagnosis report, which is a thematic report of all the challenges and opportunities. So we take all that information and say, we heard these big themes, and we'll talk about that um, in, the next, uh, in the next part. And then each of those themes usually have like both challenges and opportunities that are that come to surface. And sometimes they're the same thing as both challenge and an opportunity, but we try to tease those things out and then call out where we heard that information, whether it was in the survey, whether it was in internal stakeholder analysis, or it was in um, the uh, community engagement, just to kind of paint the picture of where people were coming from when they had those perspectives. Um, and then the diagnosis is not a one for one with what the strategy meant, uh, turns into. It is just a list of everything that we should consider when we're thinking about building our strategy. So it serves as the fundamental base, basis for what we build strategy off of. Um, so we build, from there we build what are called guiding pillars, which you'll see those in the strategic plan, which really set the parameters of where are we, where are we going and where are we not going. These are the areas we want to focus on, really want to lean into, and they're very, very, they're, they're, they're broad by nature. Um, but they are directed. They're saying we are going this direction versus going in a different direction. And then subsequently, we build out what's called coherent uh, called action areas. And action areas are how we, what are we actually going to be doing? What are the big bodies of, of work that needs to get done over the next five years to move the strategy forward? Um, and within each of those action areas are where we have very tactical objectives and key results for this first year. So how do we actually activate this plan or what's called objectives and key results? 
their goals for the year and measurables and how they're going to move the strategy forward. So that's all in the implementation plan um, further down in your packets. Um, so to talking specifically about the library, um, uh, what I mentioned, we talked, we came to, got to the point where we had a diagnosis. The key themes that came out of the diagnosis are on the screen right now. So these five different areas were what thematically arose when we did all the synthesis of all the information for the library. Um, we had things around, uh, you know, around the access and equity, court connection and collaboration, messaging and marketing, adaptability and resiliency, and then organizational excellence. And we have all those fine detail summaries as well as um, uh, uh, opportunities and um, challenges in that diagnosis report. But some of the interesting findings that we heard throughout, the, throughout this process on the equity and access, for, for example, the library is really a valued institution in the Lafayette community where it's seen as both the philosophical, like having like this calm attitude towards, and practical engine of equity in the Lafayette community. So it's really something that we heard throughout this is like, you're doing really good in this, you must continue. And so that was definitely a huge positive uh, finding that we had throughout that process. And then the connections and collaborations, one of the big findings was that the library is also a trusted and respected institution. It's seen as a place where we can come together and connect with one another. Uh, it's also seen as a potential leader in convening community-minded organizations and ensuring strategic collaboration towards the pursuit of common goals. And we heard this in a lot of different formats throughout the process. On the messaging and market side, um, there's, uh, there was uh, a lot of expression around the reliability of and access of information that the library is able to put out through its programming. A lot of people felt that uh, the library is well positioned to serve as a central organizer and distributor of information because they do have that trust with their um, with the residents. Uh, from an adapt adaptation and sustainability uh, adaptation and sustainability. Sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, adaptation and resiliency. Sorry about that. Um, one of the cities. Uh, uh, some of the comments we heard is that they believe that the library is one of the city's most admired and adaptive and experiment-oriented departments. Um, the stability of the future funding is also is it something that came up as a challenge of like how do we make sure that the library still has the types of resources needed to be able to continue to do the work, the, the true community work that's on the table. Uh, and there, all the other challenges came up around this um, around this theme around um, you know staffing and technology and making sure that the organization continues to really be truly community oriented. Uh, throughout its programming. And then the last thing around uh, organizational excellence is that the, you know, while the library staff is viewed as very skilled and dedicated and responsive to the diverse needs of patrons and seen as a source of strength, um, that there's, there's uh, uh, some need around how do we do better around collaboration or increased efficiency uh, and then working on interdepartmental uh, collaboration. So there were some, there were some pluses and minuses we heard throughout all of this, but it all manifest into what we actually do with that, which is um, talking about the strategy, which is the next slide. Um, at its highest level, the strategy ended up with three guiding pillars. That is equity, access, diversity, and inclusion. And there's definitions for all of these also in the strategic plan. We just had the highest level uh, context of it. Uh, organizational excellence. So how do we do better? How are we more efficient? How do we work in collaboration? Connection, outreach, and engagement. Uh, was the third guiding pillar. And then down the um, left-hand side, you'll see all the action areas. These are the big bodies of work that I mentioned that the library is committed to focusing on over the next five years. And that's really addressable over the next five years. Um, adopt a departmental uh, DEI lens, and so it's continuing to advance the work that the, that the library's been doing and really, really uh, focusing on that. Expanding capacity through collaboration, that's working with other organizations across uh, and being kind of that um, you know, messenger and communicator across the across the city, uh, pursuing op operational excellence, which we, or, uh, operational efficiency rather, uh, exploring innovations and in service delivery. How do we do these a little bit different? We heard a lot of ways in which that could happen, so we really focused in on that, uh, and then strengthening community and engagement and the details of how this is going. I'm going to pass over to Melissa to talk a bit more about what she's excited about, but those manifest in how you carry out the strategy and implementation plan. It's a big packet, huh? <laughs> With a lot of information. So I'm hoping that this part of the presentation can just be really conversational. I want to talk with you about some of the things we're really excited about. Um, you know, when we looked at our mission, vision values, our mission, vision, purpose, um, as part of this process, those things really remained the same. And I think when we talk to community members and when you think about it yourselves, um, your idea of what the library is 
is kind of really formulated, right? Like books are our brand. Businesses would kill to have a brand as um, solid as we have. So engaging in a process like this um, was for one a first for us to be really doing a deep dive and to have the opportunity to be given by city administration the opportunity um, to engage in a planning process like this and try to look forward and vision and how do those enduring values carry forth in, an, in a new future. Um, and so our values and the things that we are known for and the things that you know library staff are really passionate about and that we you know live breathe um, remain the same. So the access for all is not new. Community building is not new to us. Um, I think the Lafayette Public Library has been very well known for um, adaptation and innovation for a very, very long time. The Lafayette Public Library actually um, was an early adopter of ebooks. We carried the very first Sony e-reader um, in the 90s when I was still in middle school. Um, lifelong literacy, lifelong learning, those things are all the same. Um, but as we, where we go? Went too far. As we, you know, went through this process and we looked at things like innovation of service delivery um, and um, improving processes and being more efficient, um, we started talking about and looking at things that are that are new to libraries. So you'll see there up on the top um, an automated materials handling system. That's something that's exciting to your library um, and to library staff. We're the only library in the region that doesn't have one of those. Um, so adding a system like that could allow us to innovate. It could free up um, what our staff is able to do. If they're not manually sorting books, what could they do with their time? Um, you know, libraries are competing with Amazon. We're part of Marmot now, formerly the FLC. We have two-day delivery and two-day turnaround on our materials. Um, and that is what the community has come to expect. But people are expecting more than that, right? Like, we've got DoorDash, we've got all these delivery services, and we're looking at how are we going to be responsive in that way um, in the future. So that may look like a mobile library vehicle. It is probably going to look like vending devices in different areas of the community. Um, you know, we're not likely to branch libraries in other parts of the community, but there are other ways that we can deliver service. We really want to look at our service model and, you know, we're running on a very antiquated mode of providing library service. We've done it in the same way for a very long time. So we want to look at our hours. We want to look at the way we structure um, the operations of our facility, see how we can upgrade to best meet community needs and meet people where they are. Um, we're super excited to be continuing the community engagement piece. Um, you know, we engage with our community all the time. We've gone outside of the library building for a really long time. But one thing we learned through this process was that the community loves to talk to us about what we offer. And we would like to continue that, right? So we have our library advisory board and they advise us on policy and they advise us on formal things. But that's only seven folks, right? And two alternates. So we'd like to um, develop some you know, regular focus groups, K-12 educators that we meet with quarterly. Um, that we provide incentives to to participate and provide feedback to us to community members um, in the same way so that we can continue to adapt and adjust um, going forward on the bottom of this slide there is a logo for a product called islandora one thing we really really want to engage more with is local history um, expanding our um, reach through community collaboration is really important to us and we would like to formalize a relationship with the Historical Society through MOU. That's been something we've been talking about for a really long time. Um, this plan directs us to do so um, and, and partner with them. So Islandora is an online digital archive platform that we would like to pursue so that we can make our local history collection as accessible as possible and this is something that we can do in conjunction with the Historical Society. Um, a big opportunity and a big um, partner in our collaboration is the Friends of the Library Foundation. These folks are a group of resident volunteers who for more than 20 years have been working really, really hard to support library programs. So we're going to be formalizing our relationship with them. They recently developed a fundraising committee. Um, and so we want to partner with them 
more clearly and more formally because we're going to be looking at things like capital campaigns. You know, we recognize that the library is unique and that we are able to provide all of our services to the community for free. So we are fully subsidized by taxpayers. And so we recognize there is a need um, going forward to try to find um, additional funding for the sorts of things that um, we are looking to do. So our long-term outcomes at the end of this five-year um, plan term will hopefully will have initiated a new revolutionary model for delivering service and better meeting the community where they are. Um, this will mean we will implement modern technology for materials handling like I talked about and for other modes of community partnerships. Um, technology is going to be a big, a big um, part of, of library futures. Um, as I said, vending devices and other remote technology. Um, and we really want to optimize our operations. So we want to examine how we do things and why um, so that we're making the very best use of the resources that we um, are given so that we can be flexible and so that we can be responsive. Um, and I can talk libraries all day, so I'm hoping you have questions for me. I'm hoping there are things that, um, looking at this plan document inspired you to um, want to talk about or have more questions about. All right, sounds good, thank you. Um, so I guess we'll <clears throat> open it up to any questions from council um, for, for either the arts or the library plan. Or do I think we're gonna do just library first library. and then I'll we'll save okay. some time. And, okay, let's and, focus on the library yeah. for now. Um, any questions or comments from council? While we think uh, Councillor Walton um, sent over some of her, she just sent a quick bullet point. She says, for the library, continue, these are some words that come to mind. She said, continued best in class, inclusive and progressive. Will do. Um, and as a part of the plan, um, do you mention any like uh, collaboration with the other local libraries? I know there's like, it wasn't there a point in time where Erie told its residents to come to our library to get a card <laughs> or something like that? Um, I was going to say that tracks. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. We are still part of the Marmot Library Network, so collaboration with libraries has always been a big piece. We're really looking now to collaborate more with other community organizations. Um, our space is something that we have to offer. One thing we heard in the community feedback was a, a strong desire for to sort of serve as a hub and a connector for other organizations. And um, we're really we're really interested in that. One thing I will say is, you know, we brought this all to you. We're going to bring this for approval in, in June at the sixth okay. meeting on the sixth. Um, everybody loves the library, and people don't often like to say things that might hurt the library's feelings. Um, but we are open to um, critical feedback or ideas, thoughts, and questions. Um, so please do um, share those with us as they come. And that is part of our community engagement. We're going to be looking to continually engage with folks and hear, you know, what are they looking for? How can we improve? What should change? What's missing? Things like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Councillor Barnes. Thank you, uh, Mayor. <clears throat> Sorry, I there's jalapenos back there. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I think I'm good. So, uh, I, I was lucky enough to be the liaison to the Library Board and else, uh, the Cultural Arts Commission in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> And there was no hesitation in any of the staff to pick, to continue doing everything you just described. And spoiler alert, the yeah. <laughs> Arts Commission is just as amazing um, as the people who are with the library. And I remember sitting in some meetings and just absolute frustration with the board, like, when are we going to open the doors and people back in here? They're right outside, I can see them, and they need us, and we need to open the doors. So, I thought they were actually gonna go rogue and <laughs> bring people in. But I mean, the commitment is just amazing. And I, I, I heard interdepartmental collaboration, uh -huh. which I see um, coming, and I'm, all for it because I think there's a ton of 
informing that the library can provide that's very distinct for questions that we all have. So having a faster connection to the resources that the, you know, the library has for all the other departments, I, I just can't wait for that to happen where you can be like, I don't know this, call the library. <laughs> they either know it or can find it really, really fast. Um, and of course, this keeps happening. Uh, the other thing, oh, here we go. When I heard you want to ensure that resources are available for the future, I, the people are an incredible resource. Yeah, we have a whole bunch of stuff over there, but the people who work within the library are amazing. And I'm, I just want to make sure that's in the plan. <laughs> How to uh, clone all of you, um, or <laughs> ensure that that's an understood, there's an understood minimum of what is required to be part of the Lafayette library system. Um, because it's always like Councilor Walton said, right? First in class, best in class, always will be. Um, you've, you set a standard that's absolutely amazing. And I also highlighted we can get the word out. I'm really looking forward to that because there are people who know that you can count on the library and that's like a backstop and a convening piece and there are people who don't. And I don't think that's a huge barrier at all. We just have to clearly stay like this, this, just go there and present your, what your situation is and work with the library. It's just not out there. And like, like you said, we can get the word out and I think it's gonna be an amazing surprise to a lot of people who are like, hey, then we did that. Guess what? Um, and service delivery, I love this. The whole, is it, is a, I can't read my own writing, is Shenandoah? Oh, Islandora. Mm -hmm. Islandora? Islandora, yeah. yes. I mean, I've been waiting to get more robust local history, and I literally from the ground up, like what's in the ground, mm -hmm. uh, rocks and plants and vegetables and all that, you know, and how that's influenced our history. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that pull forward. And, uh, you know, you can actually get books around the people on a bike. So just... <laughs> Noted. Noted. I got one. I got one. <laughs> And formalizing the relationship between the historical society and the friends of the library, that, that is, that's a dream come true to make that happen because it's just amplifying, throw gasoline on the fire. No, wrong <laughs> uh, Amplifying, you know, the resources that are available because they're just amazing uh, networks that we have and are consistent. So this is really super exciting. Thank you. Hey, any other questions or comments from council? Very exciting. Congratulations. Thank really, you. Really should we're, be very, proud of your work. we're very excited. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Director Heisel. And back to David. Yeah, just one, one more one more like quick story. I mean, you mentioned like when people went out to the communities and that they the community engagement wants to continue. We do a lot of this work, we do ten to twelve strategic plans every single year. We get through some of these in life where they're very excited about what's to come for those organizations. Very few times do we have large swaths of people saying, I want to be on your board. I want to, I want to be, I want to be on a create a separate board and put me on it. Like I want to be like a volunteer my time. I want to be part of what you're doing. And we heard that time and time again throughout stakeholder engagement about these two departments. Like they want to like take time out of the day and be part of it. And that's that's almost unheard of. And so like I'll just say that that just shows like exactly what you highlighted uh, of how important those organizations are and how people are like, yeah, like, sign me up, I'm a part of this. So it was, it was really like heartwarming through other conversations. So I wanted to share that story. Cool, okay. Um, similar to what David did with the library, I'll kind of talk through some of the structural bones of the ACRD strap in and then let Rachel take it away with some of the more uh, kind of visionary specific stuff. Um, and as a reminder, diagnosis report item E in your board packets. Uh, which has full explanation of all of these themes. And then a uh, similar point that Councillor Barnes made, actually, I do want to highlight. Um, these themes are not necessarily themes that the department should start doing. In many cases, there are things that are already happening, but should just continue to be an emphasis into the future. I think that's particularly true here of uh, the diversity and representation theme, as well as the community-centric programming theme. Um, but just to walk through these very quickly, 
Uh, the five diagnostic themes were communication and awareness. This is fundamentally about, I think, kind of raising the profile of the ACRD in the community, um, making people more aware of who the ACRD uh, is and what it does and all the great uh, programming that it provides. Uh, second diagnostic theme, community-centric programming. This is about uh, ensuring that all ACRD programming is responsive to Lafayette's many diverse communities, backgrounds, and preferences. Uh, diversity and representation, this means um, not only kind of providing more diverse offerings and programming, but also taking deliberate steps to bring in diverse audiences to participate in and, and view that programming. Um, accessibility, how can we make um, arts programming and specific, uh, specifically anything happening at the collective uh, as accessible and welcoming uh, as it can possibly be and ensuring that people are aware of the programming and can easily access that programming. Some specific groups that kind of were highlighted in this theme um, were neurodiverse groups, people with disabilities, and also families with young children who want to be able to participate in that programming as well. Um, Organizational impact. Uh, this is fundamentally about, I think, ensuring that the internal structures and ways of working and the staffing decisions that the department makes are designed in a way to make sure that the department is maximizing its internal and external impact and effectiveness. And Rachel Vigar, Melissa, next slide. Thank you. So, uh, as David said, um, we have our guiding pillars here and our action areas. These guiding pillars, they really form the overall strategic emphasis of the strategic plan. The action areas are a little bit more specific and directional. Um, and the guiding pillars that we see here are equity, access, and representation. This is about promoting art and artists from diverse backgrounds and increasing, as we said, the access to that programming among diverse and traditionally underrepresented groups. Operational excellence, this means increasing uh, the impact of the ACRD through efficiency, effectiveness, and interdepartmental cooperation. And then finally, outreach and engagement. This is about, um, as we said, really strengthening the department's profile in the community, making sure that they're building really strong relationships with the community and that folks are aware of all the great work that's happening. Those corresponding action areas that you can see there on the left and which overlap the guiding pillars to ensure the progress is being made towards each of them would be driving community awareness via refined communication, pursuing operational efficiency and effectiveness, expanding capacity through collaboration, reducing barriers to access, continuing to elevate equity and representation, and then enhancing that community connection, building those stronger relationships with the community. Um, the ACRD strap plan is IH in your board packet. And with that, Rachel, I'll pass it over to you to give us a little bit more of the vision. Thank you so much. I want to say, um, Mayor, I'm very excited to be here. It's my first time presenting to Council, so I appreciate it. I'm really excited that I was able to be part of this process the whole um, last year and excited to be director to move this forward. Um, we learned so much through the community engagement process and um, also brought staff along through that process, which was really important. We are one of the younger departments in the city of Lafayette, and we actually had never been through a strategic planning process at all. Just as we had never been through a strategic planning process, we as a staff had never been through a mission, purpose, and values um, development. So we, um, the department inherited mission, vision, and values from the LCAC, which predated the department. So the Lafayette Cultural Arts Commission was in existence much longer um, than the department has been in existence. So that created an interesting opportunity for us to work together as a staff to really um, solidify our uh, mission, purpose, and values in a way that was meaningful to um, our staff and to LCAC. And we didn't diverge greatly from what we had inherited, but it certainly um, allowed us to come together and kind of gel as a group um, and do that also with LCAC and PAC, the Public Art Committee. So we're very excited that we have that clearly defined and can use that to highlight um, how we work um, going forward and it is our guiding pillar for us um, and our kind of guiding light as we go forward. Um, and we came up with some really great values. Collabor uh, creative collaboration, meaningful work, community connection, um, inclusive impact, and equity orientation. So we're just very excited to um, 
have more events and programs in different parts of Lafayette. That is one of the things that we heard um, that we wanted to branch out of Old Town. And so we are actually starting that this year by having some collaborations and um, programs that will be outside of Old Town. The first one will be at um, the Nature Discovery Park at Sanchez Elementary on June um, 13th and it will be a concert with Cultural Caravan and the library is a partner with that and Sister Carmen is a partner with that and um, BBSD and City of Lafayette of course and so having programs and events in different parts of Lafayette addresses several of our um, action areas in order to um, provide more equity, more accessibility um, and really have that community impact that we are really striving for. We are exploring and developing meaningful relationships with organizations like the ones I mentioned, um, not just other departments, which we do um, and have been doing for years, like with the open space, we do arts outside, but also organizations that are outside of the city. And in doing so, we address um, reducing barriers to access, which I think is really important. Um, I think the plan, the strategic plan, has given us tools um, and um, mechanisms to really have an agile work plan that we can adapt as we need. Um, and in addition to the plan, we have um, outcomes and kind of a work plan that we'll use when we go forward to do our budget request and to do our work planning for coming years. Um, I think I'll move on to the next slide. We will work, um, our long-term objectives are also very exciting and the first, one of the first things that we'll do um, is to um, adopt a formal statement on cultural, cultural equity, which many arts organizations have across um, the country and it is time for us to do the same. We will look at expanding our facility usage and develop best practices for allowing artists to sell their work while exhibiting at the collective. And this will allow us um, more um, usage of our facilities that are in the city and also a better um, interactions with the artists that we're um, exhibiting at the time. We'll have um, a better network of partners um, that uh, allow us to expand opportunities we will support the identities of Lafayette's diverse and evolving communities and um, we will do our best to get our communicate our programs um, in ways that are better and, and um, really engage folks around across the town. Um, lots of people said they knew about Art Night Out or they knew about Picnic on the Plaza or they loved the sculpture on the street. They had no idea who was responsible for those things. <laughs> and so we want to make sure that they know that not just the city of Lafayette and their tax dollars and your support um, makes those things happen, but that the ACRD um, has a hand in that as well. And so messaging will be really important for us. Um, it was a great experience, I think, for our whole staff, and I've really enjoyed working with Melissa um, and really excited to um, present the plan to you. And I think I'm ready for questions or conversation around that. All right, well, thank you so much for putting that presentation together. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so does uh, Council have any questions or comments about ARTS plan? <clears throat> While we wait, I can pull up. It's short, it's sweet. It just says, for the arts strategic plan, I would like to see Lafayette take a regional leadership position in the area and even consider how a regional collaboration for a, for a destination art center could be in or near Lafayette. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Later. Council Barnes. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I had something to say. That was you, right? Um, so I'm really, really glad that you've gotten to provide a resource for the for artists at the collective to sell their work. Right there. I mean, wow. Uh, it's going to happen. That's great. That yeah, that's, it's. We will implement that in yeah. the next 
you know, when we, after we adopt the plan. <laughs> that is great. I'm just, I'm super excited. That's, <laughs> um, and as Councilor Walton said, you know, having this, this, this is a destination already. Yes. And I, I, I've had artists ask, like, where can we show? And where can we really show? Like, a big place. Maybe King Soup. But, <laughs> <laughs> is that a lot? Um, it's you know it's great to to have this all of these resources available, and I would like to, I'm so excited to find out what it is you will be um, thinking to to expand, and one of the so now I'm the liaison to the Sustainability Resilience Advisory Commission, and I many times have said when I was with. Uh, you know, the Arts Commission, that the arts can speak in ways that others can't. Mm -hmm. And I, I see people on SRAC struggle with how do we actually get that message out? And I've heard a lot of people reference braiding sweet grass, which is, <laughs> you know, says things that we can't tip, not say typically. It's in a book, right? Yeah. What a prize. Um, <laughs> and, I'm just super excited to, to find out how you will continue to grow the ability to, to say things that are hard or difficult. And Councilor Long and I were, you know, were talking, talking about the, a bench, you know, for people to have difficult conversations and ways to express themselves. So I, I think we have everything in place. And I'm super excited to see how you continue to push forward. And I think I may be. I'm going to be sending people mass rack to <laughs> to you to say like how do we make, how do we say this yeah. or how do we bring, bridge these um, siloed thought processes in a way that's uh, equitable for each piece. And speaking of that, the human sorry the human centered way of addressing this is like do we do we wait when when you have statements that are definitely different and they um, are represented equally. Do you do you put weight on it? How do you not lose that piece? I mean, because it's going to be in the arts. Yeah. So um, we don't we don't weight it. We we would do like we um, we do the thematic coding of things. We'll have a bunch of things that will say like it's about operational excellence. Everyone's saying we need to be better, more efficient at this type of things. And then somebody may say, but I don't feel safe at work. And that's the only person that I don't feel like safe at work. We say we have a theme of this, but there's still this other idea that we need to, con we need to concentrate on. This person doesn't feel safe at work. Is there something we're missing about that particular comment? These are kind of thematically happening, but what about that particular comment? So we bring that up and we make sure that those are shared as part of the evidence that we have when it comes to that discussion so that those voices aren't getting lost, are not getting lost in the mix. And you, you feel like everybody, everything is there. I, it, it was a great community engagement and great um, participation with our staff and, and um, our team, the leadership teams, and I feel like we heard a lot of voices in, in the process, yeah. Have everything we need? I do have an example of partnership that we worked with um, Lizzie Sorzat on the, on the art for the new bins that are on public road and so she reached out to us and we had a great partnership and and we worked with them, them on putting that call for art together and so that's a, one kind of small example big example of what what's possible perfect yeah yeah i was there yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally right. yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely uh, yeah. that's good all right anything else all right. Well, uh, I think that's all. Uh, any more uh, part? Any more presentation? No. Thank you for your all time, right. Council. As we said, we'll be bringing this forward for formal adoption. But um, I just want to thank the staff here, Rachel mm -hmm. and Melissa, in addition to their full-time jobs, has spent <laughs> a very long time. As you guys know, these strategic plans are first for the city, but also because they're first big lifts yeah. as well. So um, can't thank them enough for their dedication, both to the departments but to the community, to really make sure that these two departments are elevated in top top of the class so. we've done like i don't even know how many strategic plans <laughs> to this point but we finally did them <laughs> yeah now we have a vision and a plan forward and i think that's what we, we should have in reality we should have done them decades ago but now we have a have a vision and 
something to reference when we make decisions up here as a council. Exactly. Yeah. So, so thank you so much for your time this evening. And I think that'll wrap up our conversation. If no one has any other comments, uh, we will adjourn our workshop for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.